Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode. I think it's fairly well established by now that I love shooting film. I love the images it makes. They're like nothing else. But I will be the first to admit that sometimes shooting some of the older film cameras can be a bit of a faff. So today we're going to look at two cameras that make shooting film really, really simple without compromising image quality. They're these two cameras, the Nikon L35 AF and the Olympus Trip. And they've both got nice wide aperture lenses. Both very nice cameras and we're going to look at both of those. Today we've got all our cameras lined up and we've got a cup of tea. Cheers. So without further ado, let's dive into our first camera and it's this one. It's the Nikon 35AF and here is the camera itself. It's a lovely little thing. I'll just give you a quick close up. Now this is a very high quality point and shoot with a very, very nice lens. It's a 35mm f2.8. It's very, very sharp and it's very, very contrasty. This camera is all auto. The exposure is auto and the focus is auto. So it's really, really easy to use. There are very few simpler cameras to use than this one. In fact, using this camera is really little, if any, harder than using a phone camera. Uh, where are we going next? Image quality on this camera is second to none. Images are full of contrast given by that wonderful lens. They're full of body, depth, warmth. Bring any other superlative you want. The images out of this camera are absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, I couldn't shoot any colour images. I really did want to. I've got a lovely roll of Fuji colour film that I'd like to put in this camera, but with lockdown, it's very difficult to find anywhere to uh, process color films. So I've stuck to black and white, but even with black and white, you can see that these images really are very nice indeed. Again, because of lockdown, some of these shots are gonna look fairly familiar, I'm afraid. I've had to stay very local, and the only shots I could do are the ones that uh, I've very often done in the past, but there we are. Focusing this camera is an absolute breeze. It's the best point and shoot focus mechanism that I've ever used. What you do is, there are two stages to taking a shot with this camera. First, push the button uh, where you will, whereupon you will hear a very tiny sound. Switch it on first. Oh, we've got a flash. Let's try again. Did you hear that? Tiny little pre-focus sound and then take the shot. And did you hear how quiet that shutter was? It's not until you release your finger from the button that the camera winds on. So this is very, 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 very quiet in operation. Absolutely lovely. Let me show you in close up. So you push the button to its first point and we'll hear the focus. Very silent. I'll push it again and you'll hear the camera fire. Very silent. And then I'll release my finger and the camera will wind. Now, if you do street photography, you will immediately recognize that that is as great a bonus as you could ask for. Effectively, this camera is silent in operation and I think that's a really cool feature and it makes it a great street camera. I know a few better. Focusing is further aided on this camera by the little focus needle that you see when you look through the viewfinder window. I can't show you because I don't have a camera that will focus close enough. But in the bottom of the viewfinder, there's a little needle that when the camera focuses, it will point to the distance 
that it's focused to. So you know where that camera's focused. You know if it's misfocus, or you know if you're roughly in the right area. That's a really, really cool feature. The best focus mechanism I've used of any point and shoot camera. This camera is one of the very few point and shoots where you can actually mount a filter on the front of the lens. Look, so focus, thank you. So you can see there that this camera has a little filter on it, a 46 millimeter diameter, and it pops on the front of the lens there. Not only that, but the electric eye thingy for the automatic exposure is behind the filter. So if you fit a filter on here that brings down the exposure, for example, the auto exposure system will calculate the correct exposure for you, even though you've got that filter over the lens. So that's a really, really cool feature. So you can see that although this is a humble point and shoot device, it's very much designed with the photographer in mind. So that's why I said at the top, these cameras don't compromise on image quality. They may be popular cameras. Yeah, they are. But they have facilities that mean you can retain some control over your image. And they're just better tools than other point and shoots. Now, as far as I'm aware, there were three versions of this camera and I think several sub versions coming off from those, but certainly three main versions. So the first version, the AF, that's this one. This one has an ISO range from 64 to 400, so a fairly narrow ISO range. There was a second version of this one that extended that ISO range to 1000 and that camera is probably a bit more flexible though i've had no problems shooting this one i don't usually shoot film at a higher speed than 400 anyway so i didn't really run into any problems there is also let me have a look on here an af2 that's a dx coded camera so you don't need to put in dial in your own iso numbers uh, same lens, this is a five element in four group lens, possibly a Tessar design, I'm not sure of the formula. There was also an AF3, um, but I'm told that had a less good lens, a four element in three groups lens. So that one is probably best avoided, or at least even if that's not true, it's not going to give you quite as good an image as the AF and the AF2 will. So there's the ISO setting. You can see the number just uh, in the top window here. And it's a question of turning this central ring. It's a little bit stiff, but don't be afraid to put enough force on it to turn it because it's pretty tough. It does have backlight compensation as well. That's this little lever here so push that lever down to give you two stops higher in exposure unfortunately it can't go lower it is just a backlight compensator so it only increases doesn't decrease and that is only on the AF model so if you want that it is a useful feature get the AF model this is a very, very robust point and shoot. It's not all plastic. The film door, for example, is made of metal. Let me show you. Opens on this little catch here. There's the inside of the camera. Um, it's a very, very robust quality machine and parts that need to be metal are metal. Another great thing about this camera is how easy it is to load. So. Let me try and demonstrate. You see the red line here. All you do is put in your film cartridge. That should be quite easy. There we are. And draw out the tongue until it meets that red line. So pop your film in position just there. And we close the lid. 
Then we will switch on the camera. There's the on off switch. That can be a weak point on these. This one seems fine, but apparently these can wear out fairly quickly, especially now as these cameras are at least 40 years old. So the camera's on to get the film to wind. Push the shutter button down, take the shot, and you can see, well, you couldn't see actually, but a little, uh, there's a little indicator there that rotates to tell you when your film is winding on. And we're now loaded and ready to shoot. Unloading is equally as simple. When you get to the end of the roll, push two little buttons under here. Let me show you. So we've got button one and button two there. So we move, slide over number one. And while we're keeping it slid over, we push this control and the camera rewinds. Now, the wonderful thing about this camera, certainly from my point of view, is that when you rewind, it doesn't take all the film into the can. There is the film tongue ready to go. Let's pull a little bit more out, actually, or we might lose that one. And that is a really great feature, especially if, like me, you use a daylight developing tank that you can actually load in the daylight as well. So in order to do that, you've got to have this little tongue out in order to uh, get it in the machine. Obviously, if you have to open the can, then you're no longer protecting the film from light. So it's very important to have that tongue out of the can. In fact, even if you're not using that kind of tank, it's still um, very much, it makes the whole process of developing much easier if you leave that leader out of the film can. This camera does it to, so top marks to Nikon. Again, Nikon have thought of the photographer. This is a photographer's camera. Batteries for this camera are very readily available because it takes double A's. It takes two double A's and they go in this little hatch here. Now, if you've watched any other videos on this camera, you'll probably know that this battery door can be a weakness. Let me show you. It's a very small affair and I must admit it's not terribly well made. It's got a little catch at this end, which is very flimsy and thin. So the way to preserve your 35 AF, when you open the battery door, push it down, pull it back, and then it will open. Don't put any strain on the little catch on the end here. There are the batteries, warm and lovely and snug. We won't disturb them. Again, when you're closing the battery door, pull it backwards, push it down firmly, and then push it forwards. Don't just push it down and let it click because that will weaken the plastic and it will eventually break off. And you'll no longer have a battery door, which will be very unfortunate. I really, really like this camera. It's one of the nicest, possibly the nicest point and shoot I've ever used. It has a real feeling of quality. It is a plastic fantastic, but it's not exclusively plastic. There's a lot of metal used in its construction. This is a really well-made camera. It's simple and easy to shoot and it doesn't compromise on image quality. It's got that beautiful big f2.8 lens which really compares well with much more expensive lenses. It compares, it even gives SLR lenses a run for their money. That's how nice a lens this is. The Olympus Mu 2 will go in your pocket. It's a beautiful looking pretty little thing but the lens is not as nice as this one and it's certainly not as much of a photographer's camera as this one. This is the point and shoot that a photographer who loves the medium, who loves film, should get. And as far as cost goes, 125 to 200 pounds will get you one of these. It's a bit expensive, but that is climbing. The worth of these cameras is now being recognised. So if you want one, I would say 
get in quick. So the next camera we're going to look at is this lovely little thing. This is the Olympus Trip 35. And this too is a very, very nice little point and shoot. Let me give you a closer look. Now, occasionally one finds examples of industrial design that perfectly capture their time. And I think this is one such. Look at this beautiful big selenium cell round here. This camera doesn't need any batteries. It just uses the input from the selenium cell to drive the exposure equipment. It has a 40 millimeter f 2.8 lens and it's a Zuiko lens as well. The Zuiko lenses are almost without exception lovely lovely lenses and this is one such. Now if you're a regular viewer to the channel you may know that I really like the 40 millimeter focal length. I find it perfect for street photography 35 is a little too wide 50 seems to me a little too long 40 millimeter just hits the sweet spot this is an auto exposure camera i'll show you the exposure controls you can see on the let's focus please you can see on the top here it's usually used in auto mode so usually you just leave it switched to a but if you want to use flash then you can actually change the aperture values yourself i just leave it in auto because that's how it was designed to be used and that's how it works best there are only two shutter speeds on this camera and it really controls exposure through a fairly wide range of apertures it runs from f 2.8 to f 22 the shutter speeds are 1 40th and 1 200th so very limited range of shutter speeds but it makes up for that by varying the aperture it's a manual focus camera, it's not autofocus, and it has zone focusing symbols on the top here. And you can see if I move it around, we've got the various distances marked out there. So there are intermediate points also, and focus is pretty simple. It's not quite as simple, nor is it quite as reliable as the focusing on this camera, the 35AF. But having said that, I didn't really find that I missed focus very often. Once or twice, yes, but generally speaking, the zone focus is a good guide. ISO is set manually on the camera by turning this wheel in the centre here. And the actual point where you read it is this very small window here. This is a lovely little camera. It's very, very simple to use and it really gets some nice images. It's pretty well made as well, actually. It's all metal. I don't think there's very much plastic at all used on this camera. So we can see that. There we are. We can see that the top plate is metal. Let's have a look at the top plate while we're here. So very, very simple, not much going on. We've got the film counter, shutter release. Uh, I think that's a hot shoe on top there. It's certainly a shoe. Yeah, it does look like a hot shoe. And um, we've got the film rewind here. So it's a little bit more old school than the 35AF. It's from a previous generation really. This camera was released in the 60s sometime, I think 1967. So it does have that 60s look and feel and it's not quite as automated as the later uh, point and shoots, but you don't really notice that in operation. It's very, very simple to use. Loading is all manual. So we undo the back of the camera. No, we don't. We un how do we undo it? Ah, there we are. We undo the back of the camera using this clip here. And it opens up. There's the interior manual loading on this camera. So stick the lip of the film into 
one of these slots here, make sure it's fully engaged, close the back, wind on, and you're good to go. This camera makes great images, and I think they're comparable in quality to those from the 35 AF. I think they're every bit as good. The lens is very slightly longer, but only slightly. Uh, this is a four element in three groups design of lens. I'm pretty sure it's a Tessar design, so it's not quite as complex a lens as that in the Nikon. It's missing uh, one element, or at least it doesn't have quite as many elements, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It does make very, very nice images, and the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. The images this lens makes are full of contrast, full of body, full of depth and full of character. You won't get much background blur out of either of these cameras. They're not really made to do that. Much of the time you'll be shooting at apertures smaller than the maximum. Probably most of the time you'll be around 5.6 or f. So these are not cameras that are going to make a lot of blur. Nevertheless, if you go fairly close to your subject, go to the minimum focus distance, which in this case for this camera is three feet. For this camera is a bit less at 0.8 of a meter. If you go to your closest focus distance, you can force a bit of blur. But the blur from the 35AF is actually pretty conventional, but the blur from this camera <laughs> can be quite unusual because it only has two aperture blades and they form a square rather than a circle or a hexagon. So the point light sources appear as squares, so that's quite unusual. I'm not sure whether I like it or not. It's it's a curious effect and, and it can have its place and it can make an image look quite interesting, but whether it's the ideal form of background blur, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Anyway, it's pretty much academic because most of your shots won't have any blur. Most of your shots will be shot from further back than the minimum focus distance. And most of the time the camera's going to choose um, a, a, a sort of intermediate aperture of around 5.6 or f8 or so. So these are not blur monsters. This is a very well built camera and it seems to be pretty long lasting. The selenium cell uh, for the meter seems to work well. People do say sometimes that selenium cells wear out with age and exposure to light. Personally, I haven't found that. Personally, I've found that they do keep on working and they keep on working reliably, really. They're very tough, so I wouldn't let any worries about selenium cells put you off. A camera like this. The main fault that happens with these is that the aperture blades get sticky and so when you wind on and you want to take a shot sometimes it will fire but occasionally oh this one's not doing it today sometimes this one does just jam up and won't fire. Um, it probably needs a bit of lubrication or servicing. I've, I've not really got round to finding the fault yet. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen and it's one thing to be aware of when you're looking for one of these. Generally then, this is a great little camera and it's one that I've kept hold of, like the 35 AF. This is one little point and shoot that I have kept hold of just because it's so nice, it's so simple, it's so pocketable. It takes you back to a bygone age, it's very space age, it's got the classic look and it makes great images too. Anytime you don't want to be too bothered faffing about with an SLR or a rangefinder, pick this one up, stick a roll of film in it and shoot away all day long. There were millions of these made, they were sold in the millions, I don't know how many but they're like Model T Fords or Volkswagen Beetles. There's so many around, you can still buy a good one today. As far as price goes, these, again, like a lot of film cameras and certainly like some points and shoots, are climbing in price. At the moment, you can find them for between 
what, 70 to 120 pounds. They are climbing, so just like the 35 AF. If you want one, get one quickly because they won't stay the price that they are forever. So there we are, two very, very cool little points and shoots that give you all the image quality you want in a tiny, simple to use package that's no more difficult than using a mobile phone camera. So that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the bell before you go. Do all that youtube -y type stuff. It really helps the channel to grow, to develop and keep bringing you these videos. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to help it grow and develop, you can do that over at Patreon forward slash Xenography from as little as $1 per month. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more Xenography. Happy shooting!